My research, I try to fill gaps in our understanding and to design new experiments to push the frontiers of possibility. It's been a joy for me in writing this book to step back and reflect, wonderstruck on some highlights of what generations of scientists and engineers cooperating across time and space have already accomplished. 3. Fundamentals is meant as well to offer an alternative to traditional religious fundamentalism. It takes up some of the same basic questions, but addresses them by consulting physical reality rather than texts or traditions. Many of my scientific heroes, Galileo Galilei, Johannes Kepler, Isaac Newton, Michael Faraday, James Clerk Maxwell, were devout Christians. In this, they were representative of their times and surroundings. They thought that they could approach and honor God by studying his work. Einstein, though he was not religious in a conventional sense, had a similar attitude. He often referred to God, or the Old One, as he did in one of his most famous quotations. Subtle is the Lord, but malicious he is not. The spirit of their enterprise, and mine here, transcends specific dogmas, whether religious or anti-religious. I like to state it this way. In studying how the world works, we are studying how God works, and thereby learning what God is. In that spirit, we can interpret the search for knowledge as a form of worship, and our discoveries as revelations. Four. Writing this book changed my perception of the world. Fundamentals began as an exposition, but grew into a contemplation. As I reflected on the material, two overarching themes emerged unexpectedly. Their clarity and depth have astonished me. The first of those themes is abundance. The world is large. Of course, a good look at the sky on a clear night is enough to show you that there's lots of space out there. When, after more careful study, we put numbers to that size, our minds are properly boggled. But the largeness of space is only one aspect of nature's abundance, and it is not the one most central to human experience. For one thing, as Richard Feynman put it, there's plenty of room at the bottom. Each of our human bodies contains far more atoms than there are stars in the visible universe, and our brains contain about as many neurons as there are stars in our galaxy. The universe within is a worthy complement to the universe beyond. As for space, so also for time. Cosmic time is abundant. The quantity of time reaching back to the Big Bang dwarfs a human lifetime. And yet, as we'll discuss, a full human lifetime contains far more moments of consciousness than universal history contains human lifespans. We are gifted with an abundance of inner time. The physical world is abundant as well, in hitherto untapped resources for creation and perception. Science reveals that the nearby world contains, in known and accessible forms, far more energy and usable material than humans presently exploit. This realization empowers us and should whet our ambitions. Our unaided perception brings in only a few slivers of the reality that scientific investigation reveals. Consider, for example, vision. Our sense of vision is our widest and most important portal to the external world, but it leaves so much unseen. Telescopes and microscopes reveal vast treasure troves of information encoded in light that ordinarily come to our eyes unrecognized. Moreover, our vision is limited to one octave, the span of visible light, from an infinite keyboard of electromagnetic radiation which runs from radio waves to microwaves to infrared on one side, and from ultraviolet to X-rays and gamma rays on the other. And even within our one octave, our color vision is blurry. 
while our senses fail to perceive many aspects of the